All right, hi everyone. So thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be back once again in KITP. Um, so I, I toyed with the idea of giving a kind of more technical talk about covariant phase space, but you know this, there's too much interesting stuff going on now, and I wanted to talk about that, um, even though my, maybe my own role in it is smaller. But I still uh, have been thinking about it, and so I just want to maybe this will be more of a high-level talk uh, rather than really new detailed technical results. Um, and so my title is Euclidean versus Lorentzian quantum gravity. Um, so let me remind you that in quantum mechanics, there are two kinds of path integrals that we like. Um, there's the Euclidean path integral, which we use to study. Is there some funny echo with this? Is it OK? It sounds weird to me. OK. Um, which we use to study thermal equilibrium, physics, uh, or correlators at fixed time. Um, uh, and then there's the Lorentzian path integral, which we use to do scattering or out of equilibrium physics, chaos, whatever you want. Um, and in um, ordinary quantum systems, there's not really much difference between the two. Um, you know, you can get either one from the operator formalism by inserting complete sets of states, uh, and they're related by some uh, analytic continuation. Uh, so. Uh, Roughly speaking, they're equivalent. Uh, you could worry about Euclidean path integrals that, in some sense, is more general than Lorentzian one, but at least for ones that are reflection positive, that they're, they're basically going to be the same thing. Um, OK, now, um, one of the first things I want to emphasize in this talk is that uh, this is not true in quantum gravity. In quantum gravity, the situation is quite different. Um, and indeed, the amazing thing about quantum gravity is that the Euclidean path integral is really smart. It knows all kinds of things that it really doesn't have a right to know, I think. Um, for example, it knows the entropy of a black hole. And let me clarify, when I say the Euclidean path integral, I mean what you might call the low energy Euclidean path integral, just you know, with metric and Einstein term, maybe some matter fields, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing where you know, if you just know the low energy theory, you might think that that's not enough to know what the entropy of a black hole is. Uh, but if you use the Euclidean path integral, then it is. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really magic. Um, another thing that it knows is the Rutakianagi formula. So it knows the von Neumann entropy of a boundary subregion in ADS CFD. And so it's explained to us by Lukowitz, Maldacena, and then uh, further in these papers. Uh, if you do the Euclidean path integral, you, you know, just in the bulk, you can recast the RT formula just as some manipulations on the bulk Euclidean path integral, and that tells you the entropy uh, of a subregion in the boundary theory, again, just using the low energy effective action. It doesn't matter you know, what the structure of the CFT is in terms of the high dimension operators. Um, OK, and then more recently, it seems we're learning that it knows the page curve, uh, which certainly at first was very surprising to me. You know, I thought that the page curve was another thing where you really had to know UV quantum gravity to know the page curve. Uh, but then I thought about it a little bit more, and you know, well, it's an entropy. And uh, the Euclidean path integral already knows this entropy and this entropy. So is it really so crazy for it to know this one too? Now, I'm not trying, of course, to downplay this work at all. I think it's very exciting. I'm just trying to give, uh, you know, I wish I thought of it, right? But I I'm trying to give some broader perspective, OK? Um, so, so, you know, after, after having a, you know, a few months to think on it, I, I think that these three things really should be understood as being grouped together uh, under the sort of mantra of the magic of the Euclidean gravity path integral. Um, uh, yeah? Uh, the first line is the post grain Thomer entropy. Of course, you know the Thomer entropy without going to the atom and so on. Of course, you can have uh, some, some, some physics. But a page is. No, sorry, I would have said you don't know the thermal entropy without knowing about atoms. You can do that. No, but you have to know the number of spin states of the photon, right? I mean, I don't, you have to know things. And uh, the two, two things are quite different, right? I mean, a pulse line and a uh, Well, I don't know. Uh, no, no, I mean, sorry, to be clear, the black hole entropy, I can, for, I can formulate it as a von Neumann entropy of the thermal state, or if you like, a von Neumann entropy of half of the thermal field double. So if you like, this one is just a special case of this one, and, and in some sense also this one. So no, I, I, think, I, I think I'm going to stick with all of these are von Neumann entropies of various states that we prepare with the Euclidean path integrals. And uh, Euclidean path integral knows the answer. Uh, 
Oh, let me also add that we have extra time, so I'm happy to have lots of questions during the talk. This is a fluffy talk anyway, so, so feel free to yell at me, you know, offer your wisdom, whatever. Okay. <laughs> but it can't all be the same person, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, 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 how does it know these things, right? How does it, you know, how how does it know, right? It's just the it's just the Einstein action, right? How can it know all this stuff? Um, and I don't know, uh, and I'm and I'm not going to tell you how it knows in this talk. Um, uh, but this has really bothered me for years. Well, I guess not the last one, but these two, especially the first one, has bothered me for years. You know, has, how does how does it know? Um, and well, I can, so I can't tell you how it knows, but what I can tell you uh, is that why. It, um, isn't obviously impossible for it to know them. Okay, so this is a bit in the spirit of what Tom was saying. <laughs> um, and that's because beyond perturbation theory and gravity, the Euclidean path integral is just not related to the Lorentzian gravity path integral in any simple way. If it were, then it wouldn't be able to know these things. Uh, because in the Lorentzian picture, uh, we don't know what the microstates are of black holes. Uh, yeah, Ronick. Uh, Yeah, I would call that. I would still kind of call that Euclidean because it's still kind of the Euclidean pieces that are doing the, you know, that are doing the heavy lifting. You know, yeah, you can do some analytic continuation later if you want, but, but, you, but you're not counting the microstates when you do that. I agree. Yeah. Well, what I really mean by that is the standard formalism of quantum mechanics with, you know, a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian and, uh, you, you know, using information theoretic techniques to, you know, computing the entropy using minus trace of rho log rho. That's what I really mean, using that formula. Yeah. Well, no, I know that's why. That's why it's different than the other other systems. But that still, to me, doesn't explain why it works. I mean, that that yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, to, you know, it, yeah. It's true that if we hadn't gone to Euclidean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you just started with the Euclidean, th say you just started doing you know canonical quantum gravity, a la Dewitt or somebody, right? You, you know, you're not going to get a over four g. You know, the loop quantum gravity people sometimes pretend they do, but they don't. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, so, so, okay, I want to make this at least a little bit concrete here. So, so let, let me talk about, you know, we can't have a talk today that doesn't have Jakeev title boy in it, so here, now it's my turn. Um, so, so this distinction between Lorentzian and Euclidean, I would say, is particularly clear um, in two recent discussions of this Jakeev title boy in gravity. Uh, so the, the Lorentzian action with, uh, with the asymptotic ADS boundary is this. Uh, these are the boundary conditions. I guess if you don't already know it, you're probably not going to learn it from this talk. Um, but, you know, it's not that complicated, okay. Um, so the first approach um, is to just do what it says to do in Dirac's textbook. Um, so you, uh, you do canonical quantization, um, you know, construct the classical phase space of the theory, and then uh, quantize it by saying that the commutator of x and p is i. Right. So, uh, so for JT, you can do that exactly. Uh, and. Uh, Daniel Jafferis and I were bored one day, so we did it. Um, and, well, here's what you get. So here I'm going to do it with two asymptotic boundaries. Um, so with two asymptotic boundaries, there's a single gauge invariant degree of freedom, uh, which is the geodesic distance, uh, which, ha which has to be renormalized because it's infinite. But after you renormalize it, the renormalized geodesic distance between the two boundaries. Uh, and uh, you can kind of see, roughly speaking, the physics is that it starts out big down here, and then it kind of gets shorter, and then it gets bigger again. Okay? And actually, the reason for that is because when you quantize this, you end up with just a very simple single particle quantum mechanics, which is the quantum mechanics of a particle moving in an exponential potential. So this is the exact result of applying canonical quantization to the Lagrangian I showed in the previous slide. Um, and you see what happens is the potential is, is big at large negative L, so then you have a scattering problem where it comes in at, from plus L, 
bounces off the potential and goes back out to plus L at infinity. Okay, and that's it. What could be simpler? Uh, let me also add that um, in this way of thinking about it, you might say, oh, well, but what about a sum over topologies? But actually, there is no sum over topologies. Um, because in Lorentzian signature, the only connected globally hyperbolic manifold obeying these boundary conditions, uh, all, they all have topology r times an interval. So there's no sum over topologies to be done. Um, so it's not like I left it out. Okay, so that was approach number one to Jakeev Teitelboim. That's what I'll call the Lorenzian approach. Okay, I, if you like, we, I did canonical quantization, but then you can just derive the Lorenzian path integral from that by, by using the phase space uh, path integral, the, deriving it the way Feynman derived it. Um, okay, so that was approach number one. So approach number two is in, oh, sorry, there's a question, Mark, yes? So maybe this is a misguided question, but would you say that if I started with Charles Simon's theory and did canonical quantization, I would find some finite dimensional Hilbert space and would never be able to reproduce these results like log k for the entropy, which I can get from passing. Sorry, when you say turn Simons, you mean, you mean the 1 plus 1 BF thing? No, no. I, Sorry, I you mean 2 mean, plus 1? No, I just mean quantum field theory. 2 plus 1 turn Simons oh. gauge theory with a compact gauge group. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there, if I do canonical quantization, for example, on, on a sphere times time, yeah. I get a one-dimensional Hilbert space. No, I know, but but there, but there, but that's still the right answer. Like so, everything you do with the Euclidean gravity path integral, you can also interpret it from canonical quantization in Chern Simons theory, because that is a reflection positive quantum field theory, and you can uh, you can study it either in Euclidean yeah, or in but signature. You couldn't get the entropy, which in some approach. Sorry, entropy. What do you mean by entropy? I mean the log k that we. Somehow you mean of a subregion? Yes. Yeah, no, but that's not a that's not a part of the quantum field theory, right? That's some, you know, that you have to imagine that you're getting it from some UV theory. Here, your, the black hole entropy you're saying is not the... There is no black hole entropy in this. But if you did the Euclidean calculation, then you would get it. Like no, but the point here, the whole point here is that they're different, okay? So I can do a Euclidean, so what, if you wanted to come up with a, a meaning of the Euclidean path integral in this theory, which is just a single particle quantum mechanics, what you would say is that it prepares a state in the Hilbert space, a Hilbert space of the theory with two boundaries. And, and actually, we computed uh, in the semi-classical approximation the wave function of that state in this L basis, but just some state. And you don't, in particular, if you compute the disk, you don't interpret it as a trace. In this way of thinking about it, it's wrong to call it a trace. It's just the norm of a state that you forgot to normalize. No, 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 and that's, I'm going to discuss this Euclidean thing in a sec, but for example, if I did this with one boundary, the Hilbert space is empty. Okay, the, the Lorentzian theory with one boundary is just nothing, okay, which is different than the words that I'm going to discuss in a minute that people say when they start from the Euclidean picture. Um, yeah? Uh, why are you only considering globally hyperbolic analysis? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I, I, I'm not totally sure what to say about that, except that... Um, if you start with canonical quantization and then you follow Feynman's prescription, I think that's what you're going to get. You're, you're going to get this topology. Um, so, uh, well, you insert complete sets of states, right? So start with, yeah, start with e to the minus iht and then split it up into pieces and insert complete sets of states. They're going to be complete sets of states which say in the L basis, right? And, and you're going to derive the Lorentzian path integral on this manifold without any other uh, I mean, there's nothing else you can get. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're just saying that given the Valencian path integral, you could never split up. Well, that was the comment here. Is, yeah, just, it's not even a statement about solutions. It's just a statement about Lorentzian manifolds. They don't change topology unless you violate global hyperbolicity. If you throw away the point, if you throw away, if you're allowed to throw away some points, then you can do it because if you try to have it be global hyperbolic, the metric has to break somewhere to have the topology change. You can always throw that point away and then say it's a Lorentzian manifold, but that's not natural from the point of view of canonical quantization. You don't throw points away. So this approach in first quantized string theory would just yield uh, a single string. Yeah, that's correct. This, yeah, this would be the free string. Yeah. Yes, Eva? Sorry, I, 
No, 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 no. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not that's like, yeah, no. And, and even the Euclidean thing I'm going to discuss in a second, it doesn't include them either. I mean, Douglas added that, because, you know, to, to, to that, that's like another thing that you can add to the model, but I'm not going to add that thing here. No, no, of course not. I mean, I think Douglas would agree with that if he's here. Yes, I agree. Yeah, it's just a thing you add. It's just a thing you add, because you can. Um, there was another question here. Yeah, before we completely leave the subject of global hyperbolicity, this yeah. manifold does not look globally hyperbolic to me. Is it? Oh, you mean because of the ADS boundary? You need the compactification to be globally hyperbolic? Yeah, yeah. So, so the global hyperbolicity is uh, usually defined for manifolds without boundary. But if you define it for manifolds with boundary, then I would say that ADS is globally hyperbolic. The relativists might fight with me about that, but I think it's correct. Yeah. Um, Uh, yeah, so we, right, so we could, right, so we could, but I don't think we have to. So, so this, the, theory, the theory that I obtain by, by following Dirac's textbook doesn't tell me that I have to include them. I could, I could say in addition to this line here, there's a circle over here. And then what would happen is that the two would just evolve completely independently. So if you like, I'm taking the minimal choice of not including them. There are no amplitudes between them. If you, if you start with canonical quantization, there's never an amplitude between them. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to say this is the most exciting theory in the world, but it's a theory that's consist self consistent. Uh, and I, I claim it's what you get if you just do what you learned as an undergraduate, starting from that action. Okay. Now, of course, well, most of us, I guess, aren't undergraduates. So the second thing that we can do is we can say, okay, forget about that, uh, you know, Canonical quantization, that's boring. Let's do, uh, let's just start with the Euclidean path integral and then uh, try to interpret it, try to, try to come, you know, including the sum over topologies uh, and then try to come up with some kind of quantum interpretation. Okay, so, so here's, here's some, you know, integral with the sum that we can do and then after we're done doing it, we can just try to give it some quantum interpretation. We can't, we can't derive it from a quantum theory by inserting complete sets of states, at least not in an obvious way or not with a quantum theory that Looks like it came from the action we wrote down, but we can just do it and see what we get. All right, and that's, so that's the philosophy of, uh, of these papers. Um, and what you get um, is that uh, you can interpret this sum as an average of quantum partition functions over an ensemble of Hamiltonians. Or at least that's true up to some ambiguity with the contour, which I haven't been quite able to decide whether it's really a problem or not. It seems, I think in the supersymmetric ones, sometimes it's not a problem. Is that right, Douglas? That's right. Yeah, okay. So that's why I decided it can't really be a problem. Yeah. Um, okay. And so, so these are two, you could call them quantizations of the JT action, and they're just not the same. You know, one is a completely standard quantum mechanics that you can solve exactly. It's a particle moving in a potential. Um, and the other one is, uh, is not a standard quantum mechanics. It's an average over some quantum mechanics. And so to me, that's the... Kind of, this is a very clear illustration of this idea that the Euclidean path integral and the Lorentzian path integral in low energy gravity are just different, different, different beasts that know different things. Um, so what are we to make of this? Well, okay, so other than this contour thing, which uh, I, I kind of think, and I think Douglas confirmed, um, is not really a problem, um, there's not, you can't really say there's something wrong with either of these things. You know, they're both uh, well-defined things that you can do. Um, the, oh, I said this already, but the Euclidean one, you can interpret it as preparing a state in the Hilbert space obtained by canonical quantization, which gives a, what you might call an option one interpretation to many of the calculations done in option two. And you can also go the other way. So you can, um, if you take the Euclidean thing, you can take the limit of phi naught goes to zero, and then uh, expectation values of gauge invariant operators will become things that you could have computed uh, in the operator formalism. So there's some relation between the two and the limit that phi naught goes to infinity. Um, but, yeah. Sorry for interruption, but what would be, if you, if you say an action, we usually need some classical system first. Yeah. What would be the quasi-classical limit of these two quantizations? Is it the same? Uh, well, so for the first one, I started with the classical action, right? And I just, uh, I constructed the phase space and then I quantized it. So I, I just, uh, you know, I followed the rules. I didn't do anything bad. Okay, so that's the answer for that one. Okay, for the first one. Well, for the second one, I don't know. Yeah, because the second one didn't start from, you know, that's not Feynman's, you know, derivation of the path integral, right? It's just viewing the path integral as an axiom 
and then seeing what you get out of it, which is fine. Again, I don't want to. I don't want to say it's wrong. I'm saying you know, it's not wrong. I don't think either of these was wrong. Okay, but what I do want to say is that even though I, I did the first one and other people did the second one, the first one is boring. <laughs> okay, it's kind of too. I mean, it's you know, it's it's fun to work out, but it's kind of boring, right? It's just the particle moving in a potential. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's well-defined, it's easier to understand, um, but it's hard to think that it's going to teach us something about, you know, non-perturbative quantum gravity in higher dimensions. Okay. Whereas, um, you know, and because indeed the, you know, the, the canonical Hilbert space is empty with one boundary, so there are no black hole microstates, and that's what we really care about. That's what I really care about. Um, you know, whereas in the second one, okay, you've got this kind of confusing average, but, I mean, an average over black hole microstates Right, it's got to be more interesting than just not having any at all, right? So, uh, so somehow, you know, the I think this is kind of consistent with the theme that the Lorenzian one is kind of you know bread and butter and kind of tells you things that are sort of maybe more or less what you think you would have gotten from perturbation theory, whereas the Euclidean one surprises you, right? It 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 it, it, it somehow because it's got this other starting point, it's able to know things that you wouldn't have got by just doing what Dirac told you to do. Um, is that Jordan in the back? Yeah. So in Lorentzian ADS3, do you think that there are tones between the Yeah, I, so the, the thing I said about global hyperbolicity is still true. Um, I don't understand the phase space as well because there are certainly spatial topologies that are different, right? And I, I think you have to, I would say, those are microstates for black holes. So in, in 3D, there are black hole microstates, even in pure gravity in the Lorenzian, in the canonical construction. But there's a nice paper by Alex Maloney where, roughly speaking, he shows that there's not enough of them. You know, there, there, are, there are some, but there's not A over 4G is worth. Um, so I, I think still, that, that one is kind of more interesting. That, that one's less boring than this one, but it's still sort of morally boring. You know, it's still missing uh, somehow, I don't know, the je ne sais quoi or whatever of quantum gravity. Uh, yeah? Could you elaborate on the phi naught goes to infinity limit requirement? Well, that, so that's kind of the thing that suppresses higher topologies, or it's the, it's the extremal entropy, the zero temperature entropy. Did you start by defining phi naught? Well, it was in the action long ago. Let's see. Uh, um, uh, here was phi naught. It's the coefficient of the topological term in the action. Um, okay, um, so okay, so 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 the Euclidean gravity somehow it you know it surprises us. That's nice, um, but one of the morals I want to convey here, which I don't think is really controversial, probably I think hopefully most of us would agree, is that we shouldn't really be satisfied if the Euclidean gravity path integral is the only way we have of computing something. I'm certainly not. I mean, it's better than nothing. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm happy to, I'll, you know, I'll take it. You know, it's a first step. Um, but I don't think it's the end. And uh, because it doesn't tell us what's actually going on. You know, the world, the world happens in Lorenzian signature. You know, we think that, you know, that we live in a quantum system with states in a Hilbert space, and it would be nice to know what they are. Um, and so in particular, right, Gibbons and Hawking told us how to compute the black hole entropy, but it was 20 more years before people started actually counting microstates in string theory and ADS-CFT. Um, and similarly, Lukowitz and Malasena told us how to compute the von Neumann entropy of a boundary subregion. Um, but I would say the Lorenzian interpretation of the Rutakianagi formula, which for me is something that goes through quantum error correction, is, is still kind of a work in progress. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm completely happy with it. Um, you know, and, and, then, and then, you know, similarly with these things with the page curve, right, I would say that, you know, now it's kind of reached the status of the entropy after Gibbons and Hawking, where, the, you know, there's a calculation you can do, it gives you the right answer. Um, but it doesn't really tell you, you know, what are the dynamics by which how the information gets out. I, I think, at least as far as I can tell, it also doesn't tell us um, whether there are firewalls in typical microstates, um, which are the kind of questions that I would like to know the answer to. Um, I could also say in the language uh, maybe of Douglas's talk that it doesn't tell you um, what the rijs are, like the things that you need to add to make the partition function on two boundaries factorize. Um, 
or the wiggles in the spectral form factor, or, you know, there are lots of different ways of saying it. Um, okay, so um, what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to bring this down to earth again a bit, um, and I'm going to talk about a toy model uh, invented by Chris and Nata and myself, uh, all of us are here, um, which tries to give a Lorenzian interpretation of this page curve idea. So let me say from the outset that this is going to be a cartoon. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not at all declaring victory on uh, doing this thing, which I think is very hard. It's just supposed to give a caricature of how things might work. Um, okay. Now, um, so I, I'm, I'm going to assume that you all paid very careful attention during the talks earlier today. Um, so in these recent page curve papers, um, there's an annoyance and there's a puzzle. So. The annoyance, well, maybe Netta doesn't think an annoyance, it's an annoyance, but for me it's an annoyance, um, is that in order for stuff to work, you have to use the full Engelhart wall version of the RT formula, uh, and that's kind of hard to compute with, um, especially in greater than two space-time dimensions. Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, okay, maybe you have to do it, but still it would be nice if we could come up with an example where you don't, uh, okay. Just to sim you know, help, help understand better what's going on, the simpler the model, the better, right? Um, so that's the annoyance. Then the puzzle, which I think is a thing that's bothered a lot of people, um, is that the calculation of the page curve seems to rely on an assumption that from the bulk point of view, the radiation is mixed. Uh, and why should such a repulsive assumption as that play any role in a calculation of a page curve that goes down? Okay, somehow it's... Why should you have to use the wrong answer, the wrong assumption, to compute the right answer? So it looks like Ahmed has a comment about that. You don't assume it. It comes, it comes out of the calculation of computing the uh, entropy via the replica trick. And the um, then goes to one. No, but that, so that's, the Euclid, that's Euclidean gravity, though, right? Yeah. So the, the idea here is, where, I, I, again, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I, I'm trying to understand the Lorenzian. Remember, the RT formula, I would say, has a Lorenzian interpretation through quantum error correction. Right. I understand. I'm so, commenting that in, that in our calculations and also the standard. No, but again, I'm not saying the Euclidean path integral gives you the wrong answer. Right? I mean, it, the, the point of this talk is that I accept it gives us the right answer and I want to understand it. I, I, I'm just having trouble with the word assumption. It's not an assumption, it comes out of the calculation. No. But would you agree that it's still a puzzle, given that the other answer you get from this calculation is that the entropy is zero? Yeah, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that the formulas are wrong. Okay, I'm just saying it's, to me it seems weird that when you compute something where you know that the answer is supposed to be that the radiation is pure, why in the middle of the calculation you use formulas where it looks like it's mixed? Okay, yeah, Tom has a comment also. If you're doing the Lorentzian picture here, you should say the calculation gives mixed plus order e to the minus s. Um, well, no, you wouldn't, I think you wouldn't say that for the entropy, right? You might say that for the state, but as you explained, you probably wouldn't say that for the entropy, right? You can't calculate the entropy by a Lorentzian. If you're using Lorentzian, you can't, I don't know any other way to calculate the entropy, so then I don't know what. Well, I know. That's why, I, I mean, that's why I'm saying that I want a Lorentzian interpretation, right? I mean, I, again, I'm not, I, I'm not saying the formulas are wrong, right? It's just that, I mean, this is just part of this complaint that if we really had a Lorentzian picture of what was going on, we probably wouldn't need to talk about using a state where the radiation is mixed. I mean, we, if, we, if we had a, a full quantum picture of what was going on in the bulk. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to say that the, the Euclidean path integral somehow knows, takes this into account, but, but, but I, I don't know in Lorentzian signature how to think about that. Well, in this model, I think I, I kind of know, but, but, but probably not in the real thing. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, in this, in this paper with Netta and Chris, um, we wanted to come up with a model that was simpler, which would avoid the annoyance and clarify the puzzle. Um, and moreover, I would say um, our dynamics are explicit, albeit artificial, um, and uh, we don't have to use any of this uh, sort of what I might call Euclidean gravity magic, although we still use it to prepare states, just because you've got to get your states from somewhere. Um, Okay, so let me now talk about the model. So 
the idea is that um, rather than having a black hole evaporate into soft quanta, which is kind of the thing that forces you to consider quantum extremal surfaces, we're going to do something cruder, and we're just going to have the black hole evaporate into smaller black holes, um, each of which is going to end up in its own asymptotically ADS universe. So this may seem a bit weird, but what we get out of it is that we get a completely explicit holographic description of what's going on at every step in the evaporation process. Um, and let me also say that um, many of the black hole paradoxes, for example, the first firewall paradox, are just about the structure of the state at a fixed time. So the dynamics of how you cut the state are kind of of secondary importance, at least for some of the paradoxes. Although, of course, we also want to know what the dynamics are in the real thing. OK. Um, now, to construct the detailed model, I have to use um, multi-boundary wormholes. And let me emphasize that these are spatial wormholes. So until you know two months ago, I, I wouldn't have had to say that, but now I have to say it. So these are spatial wormholes, not space-time wormholes. Um, and these are simple to understand in 2 plus 1 dimensions. So I'm going to work in 2 plus 1 dimensions, uh, since there aren't any gravitons. Um, and the idea is that you can construct multi-boundary wormholes by doing quotients of ADS-3. Uh, and I'm going to restrict to quotients which are time reflection symmetric, because that makes it easy to do the computations. In fact, so easy that we can just draw pictures, and we don't even have to do the computations. Um, so these, uh, since they're time reflection symmetric, the idea is that then the spatial geometry on a fixed time slice is going to be a quotient of the Poincaré disk. So uh, if you're someone who likes, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, string perturbation theory at high genus or something, then these pictures will make immediate sense to you. Um, if they don't, I'll show you what they look like in a sec, more conventional way. But let me just first say, so this one is the cylinder, and this one is the pair of pants. So like uh, the pair of pants has, an, uh, here's like the waist, and then here's one leg, and here's the other leg. And if you chase through the identifications, that's what it looks like. Uh, and indeed, here, here's what they look like in a uh, more heuristic representation. Um, now, there are three things that we need to know. The first is that in this Poincaré disk, for each of these semicircles, I can find the line of minimal length connecting each pair. And that defines these curves gamma, gamma, gamma prime, gamma prime. Here's what they look like here. So gamma is kind of the belt of the thermofield double. And then over here, the gamma is kind of, I've taken it to be the union of these two. And then here's gamma prime over here. That's another one of these. Um, so the key thing is that these dotted lines are space-time geodesics, and thus they're candidate HRT surfaces. Okay, so again, let me emphasize, this is the spatial geometry. Okay, so these uh, dotted lines are co-dimension two in space-time. Um, okay, now uh, another key point is that for um, greater than two exits, the lengths can be adjusted independently by playing with the moduli. Um, of, the, of the identification. Um, and then finally, um, these states have, uh, well, at least in favorable regions of moduli space, they have completely explicit representations in the dual CFT, which are obtained by cutting a Riemann surface. So you do the CFT path integral on a Riemann surface, but then you cut it, and then that prepares the state on one of these. So, so this, uh, this disk here is like the t equals zero cut, um, sorry, the boundary of this disk is the t equals zero cut of the boundary room of the CFT Riemann surface. Uh, and then this extension into the bulk, if you like, is a cut of a handle body, if you know what that is. Um, OK. All right, so that's just the tools. Now let's say what the model is. So it's very simple. Um, the idea is that we start with a holographic CFT, two, uh, one plus one CFT, uh, on a large number of spatial circles. And the initial state is that we have a three exit wormhole on three of them, with a big exit and two small exits. And then we've got the vacuum on the, on the rest. So that's the initial state. And then the evolution is like this. So, uh, so here's the initial state. Well, actually, here I've already done one step of evolution. The idea is we have the octopus. Um, the big exit is the head. The small exits are the feet. And then the octopus just keeps growing feet. Uh, so we, uh, we, we tune the CFT Hamiltonian to just evolve us from one state to the next. And let me emphasize that this evolution couples all the circles together. So this is uh, not the normal evolution of the CFTs. You're mixing different boundaries together. Um, so um, the, 
Now to compute the page curve, right, we can just do it using the RT formula. So here's the idea. So the little exits are going to be like a, the analog of the Hawking radiation. The big exit is the black hole. As time goes on, this one gets smaller, these, uh, and then there are more and more of these, okay? Then uh, to compute the von Neumann entropy of the Hawking radiation, we're supposed to find the RT surface for the union of the small disks. So that's this thing I called gamma here is one possibility. This thing I called gamma prime up here is the other possibility. Um, so these things have names. So there's a competition between the headband and the ankle bracelets. Okay. <laughs> um, those are the two candidate RT surfaces. Uh, and to find the entropy of the radiation, we take whichever is smaller. Okay. Now, um, well, let me say it in words, actually. So initially, um, the ankle bracelets are smaller, right? Because this is a big black hole here, and there's only a few of these legs. So uh, gamma has smaller length than gamma prime. So at early times, gamma is the RT surface, okay? <laughs> so then as time goes on, right, we're adding more legs, so gamma is growing linearly with time, all right? That's the initial part of the page curve. But then gamma prime, well, while gamma is growing, gamma prime is shrinking because the black hole is getting smaller. So I, I choose the dynamics to conserve the total energy. So that controls how, how fast it's shrinking. Um, and so at some point, there's going to be a crossover. And then uh, we're going to switch to the headband. And the headband is getting smaller with time. And so we get a page curve like that. Okay. Um, so I claim this is really the essence of these papers about the page curve. But this is just so simple that there can't be any confusion about it. Right? It's just a classical RT surface. You have the crossover. Um, let me also say that at the same time that the RT surface jumps, the entanglement wedge uh, also, of course, jumps. Um, and it jumps from, so when it's gamma, it do, the entanglement wedge of the radiation does not include the interior body of the octopus. But at late times, it does, because now this is the RT surface, and so now the interior is in the entanglement wedge of the radiation. Um, so like in particular, if you, if you throw some information into the black hole after the page time, then you can get it right back, uh, as in Hayden and Preskill. Okay. So really quite simple, I think. Um, now, I want to make another comment about something which I think some people know and some people don't. So, so this body of the octopus is an example of this thing that was called the island um, in this paper, the, the body of the octopus here. Um, and indeed, this island is really a standard part of the story of quantum error correction in ADS CFT. So, so let me go back to the first example, right? You take, uh, you know, in the vicinity of the vacuum, you split the boundary up into three regions, and uh, you have um, this white region in the center, uh, which is, you can call an island, um, which has the property that it's not in the entanglement wedge of any one of the regions, but it is in the entanglement wedge of any two. Uh, and so, for example, for the early black hole, you can think of these two as being the black hole, and this one as being the radiation. And then the island is in the entanglement wedge of the black hole. Whereas um, at late times, you say maybe these two are the radiation, and this one is the black hole. And now the island is in the entanglement wedge of the radiation. Okay. So this idea that the, whole is, that the whole is somehow more than the sum of its parts is really the essence of quantum error correction. Um, so let me say that mathematically. So the right way to say this mathematically, this idea of the island, is that you have an isometric embedding of a tensor product of four things. This gray region, this gray region, and this gray region, which I'll call lowercase r1, r2, and r3, and also the island, mapped into a boundary Hilbert space, which is a tensor product of three things, not including the island. Okay? Well, I shouldn't say that. There's, just, there's no boundary factor associated to the island. Um, and so then... This island, and, and also these other regions with the lowercase r, you're supposed to think of them as part of the shared dual of these three things. And the fact that the island exists is a consequence of the fact that we're restricted to being in H code. So if you hadn't restricted to being in H code, you would have never found an island, right? The island is only there because you know that you're in H code. You're promised that you're going to be in H code. And once you're promised that, then the you have the magic of quantum error correction at your disposal, and that can give you the island. Um, so I think that this clarifies the role of this mixed radiation that was appearing in the calculations, uh, the thing that I complained about before. Um, and 
so let me try to say it precisely in terms of this island formula. So here I, I just took this from, uh, from this paper. Um, so this is the island formula as written in this paper. And the thing that is puzzling about this formula is that, as Ahmed said in his talk, although didn't write in the equation, the symbol R means different things on the two sides of this equation. Um, it doesn't mean the same thing. In, in particular, if you take this row of the island union R and you trace out I and you ask what do you get for the state of R, what you get is a mixed state. But if you take the row R appearing over here, and so I, they put the tilde here, to, I think to emphasize this, so I'm putting it too. So the row tilde R and the row R are different states. And in particular, this one is pure at late times and this one is mixed. And then it's kind of puzzling. Why are there two different states for the same thing? Shouldn't there just be one state? Okay. And the resolution, I would say, is that really the formula should have been written like this. So the R that was appearing here wasn't really a capital R. It was a little r, um, like this. Okay? And in this model, this shaded region here is not equal to this boundary region here. Right? They're living in different Hilbert spaces. The little r1 is part of this tensor product of four things, which is isometrically embedded in here. And since they're different states of different things, it's okay for them to have different entropies, okay? Um, so, uh, so here, um, in this formula, I is the island, and R is not the bath. Instead, it's a bulk region, which in these examples is the causal wedge of the boundary subregion R, okay? Now, more generally, I don't think it'll be the causal wedge. This is actually, I don't know if Jeff is here. This is related to, a, I think, a comment he made in his talk. I think probably the right way to think about this little r is that it's some kind of union of entanglement wedges of pieces of r that aren't too big, okay? It's kind of the, this little r is like the region in the bulk that you can get only by only using simple operators in this, re, in this region big r, okay? I would like to understand that better. I, haven't, I think that there's probably some nice stuff to understand about making that work, but so far that's the best I got for you. Um, okay. Um, oh, sorry, questions? Yeah, Tom? When, when region big R is entirely in the field theory region, um, so in, in your example there's a big R and a little r. Yeah, yeah. But when region big R is entirely in the field theory, in the exterior CFT only region? No, then I, I think it's... I think there's still a distinction, though. I think little, so little r, so, yeah, maybe I have to draw a picture, so. It's the same region, though, right? No, but it's not really, yeah. So that, that, I mean, this is the thing which is very puzzling, right? But so, so like, let me draw this picture, okay? Um, where, like, here's the joining, okay? And then here's the, here's the rest of the system is over here, right? So, okay, so, so here's little r here. And it's very tempting to say that it looks a lot like big r, right? <laughs> Ending before the point? No, no, any, let's say ending right, I mean, there's, you know, there's a circle here, right? And then, you know, whatever. Make it end halfway? Uh, oh, you want to you put it, like, over here? Yeah. yeah, that's fine. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. I, I would still say the same thing. I would say there's a little r here, which is not really the same as big R, even though the, this looks like it's part of the Hilbert space. You know, this thing looks like it has the same Hilbert space as the radiation system. But this only makes sense in the code subspace. I think that's the difference. So if you like, um, you in the, um, well, the, the, so the code, the code subspace, so in, in this example, we could think of the code subspace as a tensor product, okay? In, in this example, I think we probably can't quite think of it as a tensor product. And um, to act when you, this little, you know, you know if you act, let me say it in a different way. If you act with an arbitrary operator on big R, it takes you out of the code subspace. Whereas this little R to me is, if you ask me in my heart of hearts, what is it? It's an algebra that preserves the code subspace. Okay? This is a semantic thing because R is the space is a region. And in this region, we have different states. No, but the, 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 no, but the, the state of capital R is unambiguous, right? It, No, but I don't understand what it means to talk about the semi-classical state of this boundary thing R. But there is a, there is a region, the boundary R, the set of operators. But and on the 
I'm only going to allow you to compute an entropy using the formula minus trace of rho log rho. Okay? That would be the wrong formula No, I don't think so. I think that's always the right formula. Yeah, but the question is why, right? So, so, in, so in, in my paper from 2016, I explained how to interpret the Rutakinagi formula starting from trace of rho, minus trace of rho log rho. And the idea was that the code subspace is isometrically embedded into the Hilbert space. And there's this state called chi, which explains the area term. And then the entropy that shows up in the bulk entropy is, is a code subspace entropy. It's not an, it's not an entropy of this boundary thing, because within the code subspace, you can't see this tensor factorization. You, you just can't see it. No, I know, but to see this, you have to go out of the code subspace. Or in, other, in other words, if you like to, when you do some operation here that decodes the island, you're going to destroy the semi-classical picture of the bulk. Um, Well, I, I mean, I'm not, I mean well, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that whatever you're thinking in your head is right. But, <laughs> but, but I can only say that to me, the formula as you wrote it was confusing. And that when I think about it this way, it's not confusing. So I'm, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, here, here it's very clear what's going on in, in, this, in this example. And it's very clear that this little r is not the same as the big r. And I think that that's true in the example you did, too. And I think you're, I think you're, what? Can you show where big R is on well, there? Big R is not a region of the bulk. That's the whole point. So yeah, yes, I can. I can show you exactly where. Here, here is the, the, the full microscopic description of, is like that. Okay. And here's big R. But the, the region appearing in this picture is not the same thing as the region appearing in this picture. The, the, the meaning of those regions and equations, and you think of them in terms of algebras, is different. Um, yeah, Raphael? I think there's, once you take the radiation out of the bulk and into an auxiliary system, there's an ambiguity about whether you think of that as having, take, having taken it from the bulk and into an auxiliary system, or having taken it out of the boundary and into an auxiliary system. But the thing is... We're arguing about the fact that we get to think of it either way. I'm, I think, on the other hand, if we just leave the, the boundary alone and don't introduce an auxiliary system, we can still introduce all the ingredients uh, that, that are in play here. In that case, it's completely unambiguous that you're discussing a thing that's analogous to the three boundary problem. Yeah. I mean, we don't need the auxiliary system in this. I don't think we get into this argument. Well, I, I, I mean, he, he, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you can choose to be bothered about this thing of the of the state where the radiation is mixed and the state where it's pure or not. But I think kind of in this picture, it's kind of clear that there is a sense in which they can both be right in some, in some precise sense because they're not the same thing. So I, I think what Juan has in mind is instead of talking about the code subspace, he says just do the bulk calculation. And don't, don't try to even interpret it in the CFT. Just do the bulk calculation. But for me, for me the point of of quantum error correction is to show how bulk calculations are actually embedded into the CFT. And that's what I'm trying to describe here. You know, I, I don't want to do any calculation that I can't interpret in the CFT. Um, and and the, this paper I had from 2016 kind of shows how to interpret both sides of the Rutakianagi formula in the CFT. That, that was the point of that paper, was that, was that it showed the CFT calculation of the right-hand side of the, of the RT formula. And so I'm trying to do the same thing here. Um, so, okay, um, let me uh, wrap up here. I'm at my conclusion. Yes, Rob. Um, so, uh, okay, so just a, sort of a few comments here. So, so in gravity, uh, I argue that the low energy Euclidean and Lorentzian path integrals are inequivalent. And in JT, that was very clear. They just, uh, they led to different words when we tried to interpret them quantum mechanically. And, and the words weren't isomorphic. They're really different. I mean, either 
you're a particle in a fixed potential or you're an average over uh, you know, matrices, and those aren't the same thing. Uh, no, no, but that won't turn it into the Euclidean one. That, the, the circles then will just be sitting there in decoupled universes. So you can add them if you want, but it's not going to turn it into the other thing. Because um, there's no amplitude that mixes them in the canonical formalism. Um, okay, so, so then the, the kind of moral for me is that somehow the Euclidean one is the one that knows more about the UV completion because of this miracle that you can contract a circle. Um, but to really understand what's going on, we want a Lorenzian picture. And somehow the, the low energy physics is not sufficient to give us that Lorenzian picture. We need to know something about you know, the, the real degrees of freedom of quantum gravity. Um, OK, so then I, I showed that we can realize all the essential features of these various page curve calculations, uh, the exchange of dominance, islands, and so on, in this very simple geometric model where we didn't have to compute any bulk entropies. Um, then I said that um, this radiation, which is mixed in the discussion of, of these papers, or equivalently this R that appears on the right-hand side of the island formula, I think should really be thought of as a bulk region, which in our model was the causal wedge, but more generally is probably this union of, of constrained entanglement wedges, um, uh, which is some bulk region that you get from the, the radiation in the dual description, but it's not the same thing. Um, uh, and, and this removes this sort of apparent contradiction or tension or whatever you want to call it. Um, okay, and then finally, let me just comment. So, so this model, I think, is, you know, it's rather crude. I'm going to be the first to admit that. Um, but I, I think it's a reasonable caricature of how things should actually work. Um, you know, but to, to make it better, you know, I think we will probably have to understand more about these non-perturbative degrees of freedom of quantum gravity. Well, that's probably too hard, but, but maybe as, as a starting point, one could try to think about this in tensor networks. Okay, and that's it for me. Thanks. Well, there were a lot of questions already, but we've got time for a couple of short ones, if there are any. This is a short one. So I think I understood the conceptual point you're trying to make about little r versus big r. Was there any difference between little i and big i, or was that just notation? No, that was just notation. Okay. Yeah, that was just because I wanted to be consistent and have lowercase be the bulk and uppercase okay. be the boundary. Yeah. I was wondering if you would speculate on whether or not the Euclidean gravity path integral knows that de Sitter space-time should decay, that it should be only metastable. That's very interesting, yeah. Um, well, it certainly gives a way for the decay to happen, but I'm not sure if I could argue that it knows that it has to decay. I, I don't know a good argument for that. If we just literally start with pure gravity, you know, I can do the hartle hawking state. I mean, it's, the phenomenology is terrible, of course, but we're not concerned about you know, such uh, menial things as that. Right, right. You can just put a hard CC and be done with it. Yeah, yeah just put a hard CC. Level. You know, uh, We're sitting in the bottom of the well in thermal equilibrium. I don't really see a problem with that from the point of view of Euclidean gravity. So, so I think it doesn't know. I would also... No, yeah. And let me say, I don't think... I mean, I, yeah, let me emphasize. I said it before, but let me say it again. Euclidean gravity doesn't know everything, right? Steve said that, too, in his talk. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, you know, there are many things that Euclidean gravity doesn't know. Yeah. Um, so just to confirm, I think you, um, when you say the little r versus big r, you don't need to define the, them as different regimes. You, you really just need a, the h little r. Like there's a algebra associated with the h little r, which is a subalgebra of the algebra of h big r. No, no, but that's not true. Yeah, so that's the, not true. Yeah. No, it's because they're, they're acting on different Hilbert spaces. So h big r acts on the full Hilbert space of the whole system, okay? The algebra for H little r acts only in the code subspace. So there is an encoding. Yeah, that's issue. true. Yeah, so that's true, I guess. On the code subspace, that's right. It can be represented. That's, I mean, that's fair. Yeah, I, that's correct. So yes. the encoding isometry maps the algebra of operators on But that's not r. the only place it maps it, right? Like, I could yeah. also map it uh, somewhere else, right? Because, you know, once you have a code subspace, uh, there's some flexibility in where if you take bulk operators and push them through the encoding, you have some choice about where you represent them on the boundary, which I think is essential. I mean, this choice is what gives you the island. You know, if you, if you didn't, you know, if the code subspace were too big, you wouldn't have the island, you wouldn't have this choice. 
Uh, so it's all coming from the code subspace. So no. sorry, I had yeah. to step out for a while. So this okay. distinction between little r and capital R in the second paper that we wrote with Ahmed and Juan, is it the same as the distinction between the unbolded and the bolded intervals that we put there? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think I think in your paper the you had something of the same idea in mind, but I think maybe the well, I, I don't want to speculate on people's psychology. I mean the I think that the connection to quantum error correction is really what made it clear for me, this idea that it's really a different subregion in the bulk. I, I don't think that's what, how you were thinking about it in your paper, but maybe you were, I don't know. I mean, you know, because this, this is a, a bit of a fuzzy thing, we can all think about it in slightly different words, but these are the words that I like at least. I mean, I, I think it helps to really think of it as a subregion of the bulk rather than, you know, in, yeah, in your language, the, yeah, I think your bolded, R is my big R, yes. your unbolded R is my little R. Yes. But I want to say that the unbolded one should be, really be thought of as a region in the shared bulk, and it should not be thought of as the thing that's coupled to the, to the quantum system non-perturbatively. Yeah. Okay, at that point, yeah. I actually think we have to wrap it up for the afternoon. But let's thank Dan again for his uh, talk. <laughs>